Well, today, so I have the amazing Sir John Hammond with me. Thank you so much for joining. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate being here. Thanks. I'm grateful. Yeah, the second time already. Thank you so much for returning. It's always a pleasure to have you. You're a really kind person and it's awesome to speak to you. I've been meaning to ask you a couple of questions about Capture the Flags because I've seen you active in a few Capture the Flags and organizing as well. And since we're also hosting our own Capture the Flag, I know how hectic it can be. So I was wondering, what's your experience been with like organizing Capture the Flag events? Yeah, okay, sure. So I guess now, like at this point, uh, this year I put together three, like organized and hosted and kind of maintained three like big worldwide Capture the Flag events, which have been a little bit of an undertaking, right? We, I think there was Versec Con back in April that was supposed to be built off of the virtual security conference that the Cyber Mentor hosted with, I think, NOMSEC and Stoke and some of the others. Or, or it, it's easy for me to get confused because NOMCON, the one that followed in June, I put on the NOMCON CTF and that was with NOMSEC and the Cyber Mentor and Stoke. Uh, and following that, even late July, we put on the HacktivityCon CTF, which was based out of Hacker One and the HacktivityCon. Um, organizing that, wow, uh, it, there's it's a it's a loaded question because there's just so much to talk about, right? <laughs> um, challenge development is kind of the biggest thing that sticks out in my mind. Um, VersetCon, a lot of the challenges I had previously built and created. Uh, NomCon was the first time we like, oh shoot, we've got this on the calendar and now we kind of need to scramble and make challenges and put things together. Um, and we started early for that one mm -hmm. and that went well. That was kind of smooth because we had everything prepped and put together and we did a little bit more stable and secure things with our infrastructure. And I can talk a little bit about that more if we want to, but, um, ActivityCon, the last one that we just put on, we were like, scrambling to get challenges in we really like we want this cap we want this number um and even getting the publicity out like the announcement and the like hey registration is open and available that came super duper late uh so a lot of lot of learning points of like how many people can we get what audience and what can we tap into between the amount of players obviously they need time to know that this event is going on. So there's logistics and there's challenge development and there's infrastructure. There is a lot. <laughs> yeah, but you also want to, you don't want to release it too early either because you want the hype to be real when the event starts and oh, yeah. you don't want it to die down before it even starts. <laughs> I Absolutely. I mean, yeah, it's really interesting. A lot of things uh, in that answer. Um, one thing I really wanted to touch on you uh, worked with people like Stuck, you've worked with people like Cyber Mentor. Have you met these people in real life or was it just like uh, like we're talking now through a digital meeting? Yeah, a lot of it has been online and digital. Uh, I think I met the Cyber Mentor in person one time at, at ShmooCon last year. So the ShmooCon is another conference over in the DC area. And it was so funny because like, we recognized each other and like I went up to go say hi and we were like, hey, dude, hi. You're like, you're a fellow internet person <laughs> that, that does similar things. It's like we didn't know what to do with each other. We didn't know how to interact. It, it was really, really funny. It was a weird, like I felt like a fanboy. I felt like, oh my gosh, it's the Cyber Mentor. And, and I don't know. I hope maybe he felt the same way. I have no idea, but it was really funny. It's like we just crippled at human interaction. <laughs> That's really funny. Do you guys like, do you yourself, do you play a lot of CTFs yourself or is it uh, something you uh, don't have the time for anymore? Yeah, I used to, truth be told, and I might get some flack for this. I used to play, admittedly, much, much more than I do now. Um, these days, I'll be honest, yeah, I mean, you, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. Time just gets away from you. Um, now, I, I, okay, cool, I'm working a full-time job and doing other things and I want to put out content and I want to create, but you need to balance that because like, sure, it's one thing to train other people and to educate others, but sometimes you kind of want to be selfish and like educate yourself. So like I want to play a capture the flag, but I just haven't been able to manage it and pull it off lately because these past few months I've just been busy creating our own capture the flag. <laughs> 
Yeah, I know what you mean exactly. That's why I enjoy our King of the Hill capture the flags a lot. Try Hack Me, they offer the option for a King of the Hill and one of our members oh, yeah. hosts it every two weeks, I think. And it's like one hour of your day that you can take to just try and do some CTFs and get some, some new knowledge inside of you. <laughs> but the problem <laughs> there is if you've already done all of the machines in the pool, you're going to find the exploits a lot easier. You're going to be farther than other people again. So really cool yeah, that a lot of people are creating CTFs these days as well. That's the thing with uh, with King of the Hill, because when Try Hack Me released it, it was incredible and I loved it and it was a blast. Um, but I mean, just like you said, okay, the, the pool of machines in there is, I guess, what still, I don't know if it's in single digits. I don't know if they broke double digits, but once you've played enough, you've kind of seen them all and they don't change so if, if you've done it before then you kind of know all the ins and outs and it's not as fun for you or for the other players so I, I, it was i was like cool i have this fun game i have this little toy but then i played with it so much like well now what <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly man it's like for when you participate in a ctf there are like we recently we participated in poseidon ctf and it was like a team nice. ctf and that's what made it that's what makes it so worth for me you know the team effort playing together having fun learning things from each other as well because after each ctf we do like a debriefing and we go over the things we learned and who solved what challenge in what way and it's always so interesting because i'm good at web and other people are good at like crypto and all that stuff and it's really interesting how that team dynamics works as well and that's one thing that i've been kind of dreading about CTFs, sort of, because you cannot r easily enter a CTF alone unless it's like specifically designed for single people and not teams in mind, you know? A lot of these CTFs are designed for these really skillful teams, but I've got to say that uh, the CTFs that we've played, they've been really, really awesome at that, you know? Really diversified, some easier challenges, some medium challenges. When you organize a CTF, do you do it for like, the more advanced players or do you also keep in mind that there are like multiple people playing this stuff i i've tried to with a lot of the stuff that i create kind of put together like a a, a trajectory is the word that i use or like a gradient like a, a scale difficulty that kind of grows um and moves as you kind of progress through the game and everything that i put out i try to have a, a, a warm-ups category that is super simple, super basic. Like, okay, me, maybe here's a strings challenge with an interesting gimmick or twist to it. Here's a classic Caesar cipher or a, a cheesy base 64 string with, with something else kind of sprinkled in there to make it interesting and not the exact cookie cutter challenge all the time. But, uh, and then, then once we move into the, the real quote unquote categories, right? Between web and binary exploitation and crypto, I do want to kind of like level out, okay, here's a 50 point challenge. Here's a hundred point challenge. Maybe here's a 125 and a 150, but then let's go to 250 or 300 and really amp stuff up. So I, I hope that there's a decent, I don't know, walkway and path between the easy, good beginner friendly stuff that anyone can handle, even a solo player and some of the more advanced stuff that might take a team or much more time dedicated to it. Yeah, that's really awesome. And for me, hard to, because you also have these different categories, it's hard to imagine how much time you have to, um, how much time you have to put into each of these categories, you know, and how much time you have to put into your challenges, how much you have to put out. Because for me, if I solve a challenge, it might take me one hour. If somebody else solves it, it might take them four hours. So. It, for me, we only have one challenge in the CTF, so it's really hard. We we were thinking of giving people only six hours to hack the box from boot to root. Oh, wow. But it's yeah. a super hard box, and that's never going to work. So we gave them like 24 hours, and we're also going to give some auxiliary challenges with that. But uh, for me, uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask is, all of these CTFs that I've participated in, for me, they've really helped me prepare for bug bounty hunting in several ways. Do you think it, it contributes to your bug bounty skills to play in a CTF or? Yeah, uh, I, I guess I'm an interesting take on that. Cause so I'm not 
super duper into the bug bounty scene, nowhere near as much as I should be. Um, I haven't found a bug on, on Hacker One or Bug Crowd. I'll be the first to admit that. I haven't found one yet. Maybe hopefully someday I can I can track one down or I can pour time into it. I, again, that's the thing. I just haven't made the time to even try or to even start to look. Mm-hmm. Uh, but do I think Capture the Flag helps with bug bounty? I'd say yes. And I, I, maybe some people will take a different standpoint on that um because it's different like oh bug bounty's real world or the real corporate business applications and some people will kind of point their finger at capture the flag and say oh that's just a game it's not realistic it's who knows uh, you could i don't know pick and choose the stuff you like or dislike about each of the fields in the community but uh i think that capture the flag really does because at the end of the day it's all about problem solving and it's all about uh, I don't know, taking a challenge for what the challenge is and wanting to try against it and, and work against it and, I don't know, learn something new. And a lot of times, I think with Capture the Flag, you'll get into some weird, esoteric, <laughs> idiosyncratic, like just whatever filtering or evasion or, or mitigation techniques and bypass stuff that you'll have to do to get something to work. And you might try some of those oddball things in bug bounty and some of those might work so i think yeah it'll, it'll definitely stretch you towards things that you could potentially see in bug bounty absolutely yeah that's one of the things we've been really trying to focus on it's like only one boot to root machine for now but all of the vulnerabilities are from bug bounties every single one is based on like a report that i found in real life and that's what's nice. so amazing on these on this box you know We've tried to keep it realistic and also the auxiliary challenges we're going to create are also going to be super realistic. And the cool thing is you can also use it a bit to relate to your videos as well because all of the stuff that my channel is about is bug bounties. So I can easily say, go watch this video when you have a hint. And that's really something that I've tried to aim at as well. Um, We've been trying to make it boot to root, but of course there are other uh, possibilities like Jeopardy style, King of the Hill. What's your favorite type of CTF? Um, so I guess I'm most used to Jeopardy style games, right? Because that's kind of the most common. You see it all the time online at CTF time. Uh, I really do like the more pen testy oriented stuff, like between the red team, like like a boot to root game or uh, like a hack quest, sometimes I've heard it called, where you're going through like a storyline of a bunch of things to exploit and attack. Um, and I, you mentioned King of the Hill. I really like that as well, because then it adds a whole nother layer. Like, okay, cool, you've got access, you compromise the machine, now you really need to sink your teeth in it and wrap your claws around it so you've got persistence. Because if you get knocked off, you need to be able to climb right back on so you can maintain king of the hill right so i think that's really really slick it's hard to find i think competitive king of the hill in in like a live style competition i don't see those all that often uh but obviously like we mentioned earlier try hack me has that online rendition of it that's really cool Uh, and yeah boot to root stuff is 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 awesome and great and i I, that's probably my favorite i think that's definitely pen test like stuff is certainly my favorite the realistic real world stuff yeah, you also pick up a lot of stuff from that uh, kind of CTF. We have this one guy in our Discord group and he joined us on our first King of the Hill Capture the Flag. And he discovered that he's like an amazing blue teamer. He got on the machine, he blocked off everything due to a whitelist and it was so cool to see him in action. People flourish in these kinds of events as well. And, and that's one of the things I wanted to um ask you as well is if you play a CTF, do you do it alone usually or do you join teams? Uh, I have a, I guess, a, a, I call it like an IRL cohort or like my in real life, <laughs> my, my friends. Um, and I guess some people that kind of follow my channel probably know that well between Caleb and Julian and, and Caitlin, and some of the others just that are close to me. We, we like to kind of roll as a team and, and tinker and play, especially when we do live events or any online game. It's kind of fun to tackle that as a group of friends. Uh, my Discord server jh discord um and there are some links to that on my channel or so that we we have like a it's interesting 
I, I've heard someone say it's like a CTF work camp where some people can, if they want to play in that channel and join up with a team, but it's, it's totally optional and it's still kind of like, okay, don't share flags or do any like nonsense out, out of scope, out of the rules things. And, and I think that everyone respects that really well. It's kind of cool to find that within that discord community for sure. Yeah. I don't play as a team all that often. If I if I find a game that I want to play and no one else in my friend group is doing it, uh, I'll either go solo or just drop in the Discord and be like, hey, is anyone taking a look at this game? If I have the time to play. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, it, all, it all comes back to time in the end. Yeah. Especially with the full-time job as well, like you say, and you know the YouTube channel and everything. It's really busy, but it's also really amazing that we can do this stuff. You know, create. We have a platform to create all of this amazing content for this amazing community. It's amazing. I'll put your Discord link in the description below as well. If people want to join that, you can join John Hammond's Discord link. Um, I'll put your link to the channel and uh, all your social media as well in the channel description in the video description. Um, one last thing I wanted to ask you, is there any last tips you have for the viewers? Mm. Okay. I, I guess I'll, I guess I'll take that sort of in two different parts cause it's cool. A lot of this conversation is coming from like the, the CTF player perspective and the CTF host and, and organizer, uh, perspective. So as a player, right, as someone learning and wanting to participate and practice and, and grow, uh, my advice or last tips are every single game that you play, every single capture flag you take part in, I really, really recommend, and I can't stress it more, to like take notes and document your solutions, like write your own write-ups and obviously read write-ups after the fact because even more so during the game, more learning happens after the game where you can read the solutions from people, the challenges that you didn't solve. Um, so that's, that's one tidbit. That's one aspect of it. But when you take notes and like when you're building out, hopefully a, a giant checklist, like make your own like arsenal and inventory of things that you need to make sure you hit. If you're looking at this specific kind of challenge or you're looking at this specific port or you're enumerating this kind of service, uh, and keep building that up. Keep like compiling your own archive of things to do and things to look for when you're at your wit's end and you have no idea what to do. You've hit a wall. You can't get past it. It's always good to just like skim through that list that you have put together yourself. Like you made that. that that's all your work documented and stored and encapsulated for you. So that's, that's my biggest tip for players. That's for advice. yeah for for organizers and for hosts because now that i've kind of started to put that hat on a little bit and i've worked with a team again some of my friends that help kind of put together these challenges um never ever ever trust the player <laughs> like obviously you're you're you hosting a capture the flag competition you're going to be putting out vulnerable services and it like like software and technology that inherently has a flaw and a and, an issue and a misconfiguration so don't let them remove the flag <laughs> as, a, as a big case yeah. don't let them drop files on the file system don't let them uh fork bomb and completely destroy the service or shut things down uh, whatever you can do to have a read-only file system, whatever you can do to limit and uh, capture whatever CPU is in use or however much RAM is being put together inside of a challenge container or service, uh, absolutely put down everything that you can to make sure the students or the players don't vandalize the challenges and ruin the fun for everyone else. Because then you as an organizer are going to be set on fire. You're going to have 5,000 people knocking at your door telling you your stuff's broken and it's just not a good time. So don't trust the player <laughs> as much as we want to. Don't ever put yourself in a situation where you're saying, please don't remove the flag. <laughs> please don't change words. That, that doesn't work. You can't, you can't trust that. Yeah, that's some really good advice. As a QA tester, <laughs> I can fully stand behind that. 
we always say never underestimate the stupidity of the user. It can easily translate to never trust the hacker. <laughs> yep, exactly. I would like to thank you very much, John, for this conversation. It was very helpful for me and I hope as well for the viewers. Uh, all your details will be in the description below. So if anybody's looking for John, you'll find it in the description. Thank you very much and I'll see you in the next one. Bye, Thanks everyone. so much. Take care, everybody.